Is this good like this? Um, I, was, I was promised that this would be a, like a meet the author session, which indicates to me that it's quite informal, really. And it also indicates that somehow, for some reason, you want to meet me rather than the book, maybe. So I, I'm take, going to take this as an excuse to talk not about the content of the book so much, but rather a little bit sort of around the book to, to put the book in context and to tell you a little bit why I wrote it and what I'm trying to do in this book. Um, unfortunately, the book isn't out yet. I haven't seen it on, in physical version. Uh, I, I talked to Cambridge and they said, supply chain issues. They said, so I'm not sure what that means really in this context, but I guess everyone can blame supply chain issues. So the latest news is that it should be out on the 15th of March. Um, you all know Ramazan Aras, don't you? He, he uh, was very upset that I'm giving a book launch here. And he said, Eric, you promised to do a book launch in sociology. And I said, well, these nice people in Medit asked me, what am I supposed to say? Am I supposed to say no? Besides, it's not a book launch anyway. There's no book to launch. It doesn't exist yet. So we can have many book launches, for example, in, in the sociology department in, in Bashakshir. Um, so I am not a very good scientist, that for sure. And I'm, I'm certainly not a very good political scientist either, in the sense that I'm not very serious about what I do. Or maybe differently put, I'm still a student. So when you're a scientist or a scholar, you're supposed to dig deeper, right? You do your things in your PhD and then you pursue this for the rest of your life. And you dig deeper and deeper and deeper and then eventually you're sitting at the bottom of this kind of well and you look up and you can barely see the, the sky, you know, but you're very, very deep. Um, I'm sort of the opposite. I'm like getting more and more wide as I get older but also very superficial. So that's what I mean by not being so serious. Or to say that I'm a student means I'm interested in many different things. So I, I couldn't really just stay with one topic. So I've, I've done many things in my, my life. And this is, in many ways, this book is very, very much a new start. Um, so I've been working on political science, international relations, sociology, world history. And this is about philosophy, really, or phenomenology. And I'm reading a lot of sources that are in cognitive theory. So I'm very, um, I'm very loyal to my subjects, but I'm not loyal for very long. <laughs> so I'm loyal for five years, 10 years, maybe. And then I find another subject and I start to work on that. Um, my idea is that, well, the world needs people like me. I'm not sure if that hypothesis is, is verified, but I, that's my, my, my hope anyway. Um, people my generation, they should say, you went to grad school in the 90s, let's say, PhD, did a PhD in the 1990s, were very interested in questions of meaning. And the people who came before us in the social sciences were people who had done more tangible investigations. Often they were positivists, often they were Marxists, and they liked to measure things and put together models and be very scientific. And in the 1990s, we learned that what really matters, and this is like the, the intellectual revolution, I would say, people of my generation, was that meaning matters. In the social sciences, it's never enough to just measure something, weigh something, put together a model, but you have to understand what it means, what it means to the actors, to the people. Um, and unless you understand meaning, you understand nothing. And this kind of came to us in different forms. I mean, some of us 
and including me, read cultural sociology, for example, or anthropology. So we read Clifford Geertz and others who talked about the importance of, of sense-making. Others became more extreme and they turned in direction of post-modernism, post-structuralism. -post but what all these approaches had in common was an idea about about meaning, and meaning as a question of interpretation. So you should interpret the world. We must understand how people interpret the world. And this could be understood as, as reading of texts, for example. World as a text, society as a text, as you decode. But it was all very intellectual and very um, cerebral is about your head and about culture as a system of meaning that you could tap into. Um, and in order to understand the people you write about, you would try to tap into their systems of meaning. So I, I was very influenced by Clifford Geertz, as I said, and also by Jeffrey Alexander, a cultural sociologist. He was very nice to me, very good to me. And, how I published my first book, etc. So I was very much, um, well, you could call it constructivist, maybe. <clears throat> the world as constructed. And the study of society is the study of how these constructions are made. I called myself a cultural sociologist, I guess, until one day when I went to a coffee shop and I read a book, uh, read an um, article, um, by Mark Johnson. And Mark Johnson is a, an American phenomenologist, phenomenological philosopher. He's famous for a book called Metaphors We Live By, by Lakoff and Johnson. So Johnson is the Johnson of, of the Lakoff and Johnson, very famous book. In this article, he makes the point that meaning is not enough. It cannot be foundational, because beyond meaning or underneath meaning, if you like, what we have are experiences of the world. And these experiences of the world are not interpretations. They're direct. And this is what I had refused to believe. Like between me and the world, there's always interpretation. Reality is a social construction. There's no direct access to the world. But then in this article, he says, what about little children? Little children, how do they understand the world? Well, they understand the world by putting things in their mouths, by screaming, and by right, crawling around. And little by little, they come to live in a verbal universe, uh, um, universe of, of literal meaning, of text, if you like. So it has to be the case that before meaning, there was an engagement with the world that was far more direct. We were not born with language. We were not born with culture. And I walked home from this coffee shop and I said to myself, oh my God, he's right. He is right. There's something here. And this is when I started turning away from like my mentor, um, Jeffrey Alexander, and from people like, um, like um, Schliffer Geertz. Jeffrey Alexander was very um, taken in by society as a performance. This is something that I also wrote quite a lot about, have written quite a lot about, performances. Um, as a, well, in international relations, you can talk about the world as a stage. The early modern Europe, we had actors on the stage and the king was presenting something to an audience. It's all very theatrical. But when cultural sociologists think about performances, they always think about what they mean. What does the performance mean? And it's all about interpretation. But what I came to realize is that when you watch a performance, it's not about the meaning in literal terms. It works on a much more 
immediate level, much more directly. So someone is zipping up a zipper or someone is pouring a drink. And these are things that you watch as an audience member and you don't interpret as such. There's nothing between you and the action. It talks to you directly. And I, I remember it was a conference. I was walking around with Jeffrey Alexander. And said, Jeff, you don't get it. You're wrong. You don't understand. It's direct. It's uninterpreted. Don't you understand? And he's like, uh, no, 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 no. But I started reading more, and I realized there's a big literature in um, humanities, in theater studies, that is looking at the way audiences interpret theater performances. But those interpretations are not literal, they're not explicit, they're immediate. It's what you interpret with your body. And you understand so much more with your body than you do with your, with your head. And the perhaps best example of this would be ballet. The ballet. What is ballet about? You have people dancing, right? What is it about? Well, not so much. So but what are they doing it? Why are we watching it? Well, you know. Why are we watching it? Well, it means something to us, but not in that kind of literal fashion. But anyway, this is when I started reading, first of all, these people who are um, theater scholars interested in cognitive theory. And then I started reading cognitive theory itself. And I realized that this whole world there of people who are writing about things that have to do with your bodily engagement with the world, where your rational mind and your interpretations are a sort of byproduct is something that happens later, more or less randomly. Like 5% of what goes on in your life reaches your mind. Everything else is that the body understands and understands immediately, uh, but that never reaches our cognitive faculties. And I thought, wow, this is cool. You know, this is unbelievable. And then I was reading a very famous article by Clifford here, so I read it before, but I reread it. And in this article, he makes a distinction between blinks and winks. This is about Morocco. He was an anthropologist in Morocco. Um, well, it was other things too, but it was that. Um, and he says, well, cultural anthropology is, is interested in winks. You wink, right? You wink. And the wink has meaning, and that's what we are interested in. We are not interested in, in blinks. Blink is physiological. And that's nothing to do with, with, with us. We want to do thick descriptions. And thick descriptions are always involving winks, not blinks. But then I started reading about blinks. And blinks are super interesting. Why do people blink? Well, because they're nervous, right? Because they're in a situation that they can't control. Their body is reacting. The body is talking by itself without your interpretation. It doesn't mean anything, but it certainly conveys something about you as a person. And then I became interested in experiences. How much do you want to hear about this? <laughs> I didn't talk for a long time. <laughs> I became interested in experiences. Because in cultural sociology, in, in cultural anthropology, it's all about interpretation, right? So an experience is something that you interpret. You, you went to Istanbul on vacation, and what was it like? Well, let me tell you. And then you tell a story about what happened. And Clifford Gears is very strict on this point. I mean, you have to, everything else is just sensations. And sensations, to him, doesn't, they don't mean anything. You have to have a, an interpretation in order to have an experience. And it says, for example, um, little children don't have experiences because they don't have access to language. Dogs and do animals, they don't have experiences because they don't have access to language. 
But with my new perspective, I started to think, this is horrendously wrong. This cannot be the case. Most of our experiences are not interpreted. The best experiences of our lives are not interpreted. You go up to um, um, Sulemania Jami on a Friday and sit in the middle of, and it's Tushkin, Turkmenia, uh, sit in the middle of all these people pray, praying, and you have an experience. What does it mean? Well, you can write it down as a little ex sort of explanation, but that's not what it means. What it means is what your body experiences in this situation. Um, so who writes about experiences? Well, phenomenologists do. This is what phenomenologists are interested in, how you experience the world. So then I had access to two um, fields, academic fields. One, uh, cognitive theory, cognitive science, which is about the body and how the body makes sense of the world. And then I had access to phenomenology, phenomenological philosophy, which has to do with experiences. And then I thought, cool, let's, let's do something fun here. And my idea was to look at bodies in movement. I'm interested in how bodies, why bodies move. And the connection to experiences and the connection to cognitive activities. So, for example, in order to have sensations, you must move. It's impossible to see something without moving. If you, if you try to see something without moving, what you do is just sit like this. And if you don't move, if you don't move, you will just see what's exactly in front of you and you will not see very much else. So in order to make sense of things, you have to move your head. You have to move your body. You have to see from different angles. I mean, this, if you look at this phone, there's no reason for you to believe that it has a back. You can't see the back. Maybe there is no back, right? It's one dimensional or two dimensional. You have to move around to see that it has, it does have a back. But this is what you do by means of movement. So vision depends on movement. Um, Smell depends on movement. Somebody smells, right? You have to move to it. Touch obviously depends on movement. You have to touch things. Um, hearing also a question of movement. You can't hear well, so you have to. What are you saying? You walk closer. So this is true for all our sensations. We we have sensations only as a, only because we move. And th it's also true. I came to realize in relation to cognitive activity. So when we think, for example, well, when we're thinking, we think like thinking as a matter of reasoning or math, maybe. But originally, the reason we think is that we have to make sense of the situations that we are in. So we're in a situation, we're wondering what this situation is like, or things happen. We, as we walk around, we go to work, we come here to Sulemania to give a talk, and things happen. You wonder what they are. What is this? What is that? How do I feel? You're talking to yourself, right? So this is the most basic form of thinking. We think in order to cope with situations. We talk to ourselves to try to understand where we are and what's going on. And then this, what we think of as thinking, like, Rational thought is, is a very specific version of this thinking that goes on all the time when we move around in the world. Same thing with knowing. How do we know things? Well, we can know things by reading books about it, or by sitting through boring talks about it, or watching YouTube clips about it. But this only creates a certain kind of, establishes a certain kind of knowledge which is knowledge, factual knowledge. But there's also a different kind of knowledge which has to do with your experiences. And these are experiences not, uh, not of things um, 
that are, but of, of how things are. It's know how rather than know that. So in order to know, we have to go there. I mean, you can, you can read a book about the Mediterranean and you learn about the Mediterranean. You can also swim in it, you know? You can read a book about baklava, how to make it. You can also eat it. And this knowledge is very, very different. And it's the same thing, I think, with imagination. You can imagine things, you can try to do it in your head, but the imagination also requires experience. It requires having done things. And without those experiences, you're not able to imagine. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that you have cognitive functions. You, you think, you know, you um, imagine, you will the other cognitive functions as well. And these cognitive functions themselves are, are not happening just in your head, but they're happening as you engage with the world. So this is all the theme that your, your engagement with the world is what allows you to make sense of the world. In this pre-interpreted, pre pre-interpretative uh, version of, of, of engagement. And as I said before, I think it's very obvious when you look at children to where, where do we come, come from? Well, we came from a very small newborn version of ourselves, right? And we develop, and children explain to us exactly how this happened. How they come to know the world, they learn to think, they learn to engage with other people, they learn to see, they learn to everything by means of movement. So, I mean, all this, in fact, is just what I'm reporting to you, things that I've of rent, and there's just so much to read, and there's some great fun philosophers and great fun phenomenologists, and some of it is very, very cutting edge. I mean, very sort of new stuff, because so much has happened in in brain science and in in, in like brain scanning and fMRI MIR scans and all this. So there's so much more information about how the body processes. Um, it's um, sensory data from the environment. So it's a very exciting field. But all I'm saying now is, is stuff that other people have done. So, and, and then my idea was, what if you did a kind of social science out of this, right? How would that work? What would that be? And this is sort of where my contribution comes in, I guess. So I was very curious about a whole bunch of things. And one thing I was curious about is in early modern Europe, kings are always dancing. So that picture there behind me is Louis XIV. And Louis XIV was a dancer, was a ballet dancer, and he participated in 85 different productions during his, the course of his life. But so was his father and grandfather, and not just him, but all other kings in Europe, all the queens were all dancing. There's a peace treaty of Westphalia, 1648. The French delegation put on ballet clothes and they dance, all of them. And this is not something historians talk about. And I think it's because they find it embarrassing. This is weird. But I like stuff that's weird, and it clearly needs some kind of explanation. Why are they doing this? Why are they dancing? How strange. And my explanation is, well, we know why you move. We know why the body moves. You move in order to have cognitive experiences, in order to have in order to know, in order to think, in order to imagine, in order to will. This is why you move. Or I think my chapter on Dancing Kings is about movement in relation to being, being. So in order to be, 
You need to move. It's very difficult to sit and be, you know? So it's fundamental to us human beings that we, that we are moving. We, we come out of the womb and we move. And we move until we're dead. We move. And if we're not moving, we are dead. We're always moving. So there's a connection here between being and mo movement. And what I'm trying to say in this article, I was trying to say in this chapter, is that kings were moving in order to be kings. They moved into place as kings. How do you, how do you become your majesty? Can you just sit at home and be your majesty at home, kind of in, your, in your head? No, you have to show people, right? Here I am, I'm your majesty, this is me. And then they did a little dance, right? And we think of this as weird because we don't live in that world. But it was a way to, to get an audience, to show yourself as a, as a glorious ruler, as a powerful person. So, at least, well, this is my explanation for all these dancing kings. Um, and then another thing, I, I, there are quite a lot of examples here. I can tell you how much time we have, a little bit more. Um, two more examples. Quite a lot of dancing examples. I'm, I'm actually not that interested in dance as such. And it's not a dance, like history of dance or anything. But dance is a good example because it's obviously movement and it's also very well documented. So there are a lot of people who've written about dance history and there the, are the a lot of sources to read. So, I mean, if you're looking at historical material, it's quite difficult to know how did people move in the 18th century, you know? We don't know really how they moved. But if you, if you can read um, sources that deal with dance, that gives you a nice understanding of, of movement at that time. So that's why I use this sources quite a lot. Yeah, and, and two more examples. Um, the first example, um, European sea captains who went to countries far away, this is like in the 17th, 18th century, explorers like Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and these people, um, James Cook, they had the problem of, of finding knowledge about the people that they were engaging with. I mean, this was very crucial to them because they needed to, to know who they were dealing with, right? I mean, were they dangerous people or not dangerous people? Or should they shoot them or should they talk to them? Or how, how to relate to them? And they had no language in common, right? So they couldn't speak to each other. So what did they do? Well, the, European sea captains had um, musicians with them, or some of, one of the sailors would play, and someone started playing, and then the sea captains started dancing. And they would tell the people on, the, on shore, hey, come join us, come join us. Or, and sometimes it would be the other way around. They would be dancing on the seashore, and the natives say, hey, to the Europeans, come, come join us. And they were dancing together. So in Australia, the first Europeans arrived there, or the first British arrived there in 1797, something like that, these convicts coming from Britain. And this is how they first get to know each other. And there's a picture made of this with the British convicts, I guess they were Irish of them, right? These convicts, they're dancing with these natives on the shore of, of, of this place in Australia where they land. So why are they doing it? Why, how strange, why are they doing it? Well, my explanation is this is a way to get to know each other. If you, if you dance with someone, you, you know something about them. Again, it's not rational, right? It's not rational knowledge, it's not interpretation. It's another kind of embodied knowledge. Just like being, I mean, a king dances and he becomes a king, but not in a rational way. It's through showing his 
his physical movements and allowing people to interpret those physical movements. Oh, yeah, one more example, then I stop. It's a very strange thing how German nationalists in the very early part of the 19th century also were gymnasts. So they were um, a whole group of students who met, they were high school students, and they met outside of Berlin in a forest, and they did gymnastic exercises. They built their own gymnastic, um, like, um, uh, what is that, like, um, um, tools or instruments. And they were jumping and swinging and throwing things and wrestling. Um, but they were at the same time nationalists. And this is at the time of the French invasion of Germany, 1809. And it's a very curious thing how you combined nationalism and these physical movements. But again, there's a connection here between movement and I think in this case, the ability to imagine. So it's very difficult to imagine something without physical movements. And in this case, what was being imagined was the German nation. I don't know if you're familiar with Benedict Anderson. Benedict Anderson wrote a book called Imagined Communities. And he's talking about nationalism. And from, from his point of view, the nation emerged when people read about it in newspapers, above all, in books as well, but, but also above all newspapers. So you read about the nation in a newspaper, you imagine the nation, and you become a nationalist. So um, nationalism spread by means of the printing press. Now, to me, this is a typical 1990s explanation. It's so literal. It's all about words. It's all about interpretations. It's all in people's heads. And I'm saying, yeah, but what about the body? We need the body. We need movements in order to imagine. And if you look at national movements, what you find is that they are moving. It's a movement, for heaven's sake. It's a movement. Of course they're moving. It's a national movement. So what do you do? You march. You're marching down the street. You have your flags. You have your banners. You have your songs. You're doing it together with other people. And this movement allows you to imagine it's very difficult to sit at home and just kind of think up a nation. But if you're part of this movement, it's easy. You see the nation, it's right there. The nation is moving together with, with, with you and with everyone else. And so I go through different kinds of nationalist movements. And we have this in India, for example, um, Mahatma Gandhi and the salt march, they're marching to the ocean and they're, they're making salt. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who march together. And this is a, a way to imagine the Indian nation. You have it in China with a long march. Mao is marching from, you know, from somewhere to somewhere else. <laughs> and this allows, um, Mevlon is my China expert, um, allows us to, to imagine what China is. And sure enough, they're always coming back to this idea of the long march. That's when the, the nation was created, that's to say. That's when the nation was imagined. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I said I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a very good scientist. I'm not a very good political scientist. Actually, I'm, I don't think I am a political scientist anymore. You shouldn't um, tell the um, director at, at, at even after me. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not maybe doing political science. But at the same time, what I find to be extremely rewarding and maybe also useful is an ability to see these sort of links between different fields. And you can take ideas from one area 
just because you're not a researcher, because you're not sitting in that hole and seeing the sky up there, you know, uh, you, you can move between different fields. You can see these kind of connections. And that, how to say, like, a discovery of, uh, yeah, I, I, I think about it like, you know, Immanuel Kant and this, he read, Immanuel Kant read Rousseau and he was awoken from his dogmatic slumber. He's like, he was like sleeping and he kind of was captured by these crazy ideas, dogmatic ideas. And this is how I feel about the um, cultural sociologists of the 1990s, Clifford Geertz and, and all of this, like, this understanding of society as a text and the focus on interpretation that I was captured by these this ideas and I kind of fell asleep, you know, and then I was woken up reading about, about the body and the body's engagement with, with the world and I started to realize, wow, there's so much, so much to study here, there's so much to understand. <clears throat> One little point, um, next book, Forget Political Science, I want you to write about religion, I want to write about religion. And I'm very struck by, by Islam because, of course, Islam is about interpretation and thinking and theology, of course, and Islamic law, and all, obviously. But it's so much about movement. It's so much about prayer. It's about going to Mecca. It's about uh, fasting. Well, you know better than me, right? But it's, it's a physical religion, and I think that's really, really important. Oh, we have the dervishes, I forgot. Whirling dervishes, right? So the physicality of religion is something that, or physicality of Islam is something that European Christians, especially Protestants, made fun of. Because, oh, you're so old-fashioned. Modern religion is a rational religion. Modern religion is interpreted, you know? It's all in our heads. We're rational, we're modern. You are like medieval. I think they were profoundly wrong. I think that religion has to be physical because we are physical and this is how we understand the world. So my next book, I don't have a publisher, I don't have anything, it's just a few ideas in my head. But this is what I want to write about. The, the sort, of, sort of continuation of what I started, of, of the body's engagement with the world, but to talk about religion in that context. Sorry, I went on a little bit. Thank you very much for listening.